increasing geopolitical adoption, the integration with the financial system. And I think we'll increasingly see, uh, you know, as kind of Bitcoin is treated as this, this just, you know, risk on asset along with everything else. Like it's, it's less than a trillion dollars equities, this equity index, uh, of tech and all that's tens of trillions. And there's unprofitable tech companies that are with crazy high market caps. And so like, if you're a pension fund, if you're an endowment, if you're, you know, you're going to gain exposure. And, and like we saw that at 20, 2021, just start. You saw a, a few kind of credit funds, uh, debt funds. They just said, OK, we're going to get a little bit of Bitcoin. And so like they're not done buying. That's for that's for sure. I mean, these these institutions think with not month, week to week, month to month, but year, decade, you know, multiple decade long time horizons because they have to. They have they have liabilities over the next 30 years. Um, so that's just a start. Um, we're going to see a bunch of energy companies and all, also like, you know, all that stuff that's going to be like, you know, just another kind of narrative aspect to it. And so, you know, what comes next, I'm not entirely sure. I just know that everybody's coming and most people in the world are extremely underweight and absolutely scarce asset. So, you know, supply and demand, one thing has to happen. Dylan Leclerc. How are you doing, man? Good to see you. Welcome to the show. It's a dream. <laughs> Appreciate you having me back on. No, man, it's my pleasure. Uh, listen, Dil, I mean, you've been doing such great stuff and, you, and uh, you've been just rocking it everywhere. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, some of your works, it's just beyond my league, <laughs> my brain league. But uh, I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, for, you know, in my opinion, all the people who quit school are the best ones. You know, so you quit school, right? Because, you know, you're not indoctrinated. You you question, you know, this whole Keynesianism, this whole bullshit in dogmatization, you know, this whole brainwashing. And I mean, I think only few people are able, you know, to really like see beyond the plate. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that's a fair characterization. Uh, I mean, obviously there's uh, certain avenues in the traditional kind of legacy educational uh, path that uh, you can do quite well but uh, I don't know I was just studying business econ finance and it wasn't wasn't optimal so yeah I took a leap and uh, kind of dove into the Bitcoin uh, space and it's paid off so far I can't complain uh, definitely having a good time awesome so listen um, um, I'm gonna uh, ask you the questions that I've been given by my uh, from my girlfriend's brother, who is a total fan of yours. He's a paid subscriber of your, what is it called? Deep Dive newsletter? Yes. Yeah. So he loves your work and he gave me a bunch of questions, but I'm not sure even, you know, whether some of them maybe might be too technical, but, but hey, I'm just going to ask you that maybe in the end. Uh, but he says hi to you. Greetings from Wolfgang um, from Austria. <laughs> so listen, my question, my first question is the, the work you do, I mean, uh, you seem to have like a you know a range a spectrum of of um, of listeners followers and subscribers you know people who are following you not only individual but especially institutional like when when they read your stuff like what what do you I mean can you tell me like what is the purpose of your work like what kind of action because you're doing like a lot of analysis when they like understand and you know they they dig into your data the numbers the you the analysis what kind of consequences or what kind of action do they take? I mean, what, what is like the action reaction? What, 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 you know? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I tell people that the deep dive um, and we're doing daily uh, content or at least during the weekdays. Uh, so like, you know, for the most part, 20 pieces a month, um, you know, it's, it's on-chain analysis. If we talk about derivative markets and we talk about kind of macro, uh, but we're not, we're not really giving like trading signals. Um, you know, we, we, have this kind of broad thesis that Bitcoin's the best money ever um, and that it's in its monetization phase. Um, so really what we're trying to do is transparently document um, that happening um, and, and try to inform readers about what's happening and why. And so, um, you know, like we'll, we'll say like, and we talk in probabilistic terms. So like, you know, we'll highlight like in our monthly report we put out, we're putting out today, we're saying like, hey, uh, these are the risk factors in the, the short to medium term in the market. And we've, and we've, you know, in November and in the fall, we said, hey, uh, even though Bitcoin is, is treated as a risk off asset for an increasing amount of people around the world, it's a monetary safe haven. Uh, increasingly, like macro funds adopted Bitcoin as a risk on asset. And so if we see any sort of equity downturn or if the Fed attempts to taper, 
um, and we'll see how far it gets. Like Bitcoin could get hit initially in an illiquidity uh, crisis. And so like those sort of things where we talk um, in, in broad terms, not because we're trying to like be very vague, but because no one knows uh, over the short to medium term. And we're just trying to highlight like what could happen. So like with this on-chain indicator or the cycle kind of, uh, we can say like, for instance, we can look at the cost basis of every coin on the network. And so we can say the current price of Bitcoin is 37,000. The on-chain cost basis is 24,000. So like every user on average paid 24K or at last move of their coins at 24,000. Is it a perfect indicator? No, but there's a lot of signal that we can come from, like we can take from that metric. And so we can kind of look at like the ratio between price and it's realized price or it's on-chain cost basis and see different things. Is Bitcoin relatively overvalued? Is Bitcoin relatively really cheap historically? Um, and again, like does Bitcoin go up, down, sideways tomorrow or next week? We don't know and no one knows. But uh, we like to kind of give users or not uh, users, our subscribers, our, our readers, just some historical context, just some like transparency to say, hey, you know, if you have a, a job that has nothing to do with markets or finance or crypto or Bitcoin, like, you know, we'll, we'll help you keep you informed. Uh, and we always stress like, hey, 99% of people should just stack sats and, and, and chill out. But there is a pretty big demand from what we've seen to just kind of understand the story, understand what's happening. Why did Bitcoin drop 12% yesterday? Well, it was because of a derivative market liquidation. And here's what happened. And here's on what exchange. Um, so, I mean, those are just some examples, but that's really the purpose of the deep dive and, and what we're doing. Awesome. So is that the primary factor for the price crash, the derivatives market, or are there other, or could you like, like a little bit give an overview, like what, what's been happening with this? Because a lot of people don't understand, like, why has it been crashing like to, I mean, you know, good for the hodlers, you know, it's like the super accumulating phase, but what, what, what are, I mean, besides the derivatives market, what, I mean, uh, you know, is it like people are shorting, they need to cover their asses? Like wh wh what's going on? Yeah, so I mean, over the last four weeks, um, Bitcoin and the correlation with the NASDAQ has been uh, 0.93. So 93% correlation, uh, rolling correlation. So, um, and, and that's on an hourly basis. So like it's basically tick for tick with, with equities. Um, so kind of just showing, and we could also see like, if you look at like the grayscale, the GBTC discount. Um, the premium previously, always a premium, turned to a discount in February of 2021, uh, was a mild discount for much of 2021. And from like November to January, that discount went from like 10% to minus 30%. So 30% discount to net asset value. You could buy 100 bucks of Bitcoin for 70 bucks with, with GPTC shares uh, a couple, like a week ago. So what's that saying? Well, who allocated the GBTC? And, and remember, Grayscale holds 650,000 Bitcoin. So who allocated it to GBTC shares? Who bought GBTC shares through Grayscale in 2020 and 2021 when, when they purchased 400,000 more Bitcoin? Well, it was like those kind of the, the macro allocators, those macro funds, the Wall Street guys, accredited investors, institutions. And so like their, you know, their risk models are the NASDAQ drawing down. They just sell their GBTC. They just sell their Bitcoin. They don't care. It's not to them. It's not this like kind of uh, like emotional thing. It's not like this, you know, they don't have a, a thesis where they're all in Bitcoin with everything they have. They're just like, it's just a risk asset to them. They just dump it. And so that's what we're seeing recently. I mean, some, some of like, when we break some like levels, that's why Bitcoin kind of aggressively sells off is because derivative markets are unwinding. But really the true story has been uh, just kind of correlation with equities recently. Uh, it's the, the marginal macro buyer that was there for, you know, in 2020, in 2021, all that new money pumping in. Well, a little bit of that has trickled out. Uh, you've seen some marginal selling. So uh, those hodlers of last resort, stackers of last resort, they're still buying uh, and, ha you know, happier than ever. Um, but, and, and, and like a larger amount than ever. And like the ecosystem's growing, hash rate at all-time highs, lightning's being adopted. You have nation states talking about it, all these positive developments, but, you know, marginal sellers dominate. And so like, that's just a short-term thing. And so like, um, you know, for the time being, Bitcoin's going to be correlated with the NASDAQ and the tech index. And if volatility spikes, then in the S&P, you know, Bitcoin will sell off. And that's okay. It's just kind of part of the adoption phase. But uh, that's been, you know, driving price action for the time being. So let me tie this. Okay, there's a question like you've probably seen it on, on Twitter. Um, uh, so do you think it's realistic that in the next, whatever, six to 12 months, 
the price could even I mean, you know, I don't care about the group because, you know, they're all the like super hodlers with super strong conviction and, you know, they, they just don't fucking care about the, you know, the, the fiat price. It's just, it's just irrelevant. It, you know, we're never selling. So, um, so he's asking 2022 Bitcoin expectation, institutions enter, price rises, reality, institutions enter future markets and control price over long term opinions. Now, do you, do, do you think it's realistic? I mean, my question is, do you f think it's realistic that the price could even crash? I mean, in Euro, I always think in Euro terms, even down to 25, 20. I mean, is that like for sh very short term? Is that is that realistic? Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a zero chance of happening. It's always possible. Um, it's I would say the only way that Bitcoin breaks below 30,000 um, or even goes to 20,000 if, is if we see just a massive, massive unwind in the legacy system. Like, so we all are familiar with what happened in March, 2020. Um, you know, for that to happen again, there'd be some, there need to be some sort of cataclysmic blow up in credit markets and equities. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. And if the Fed, if the Fed breaks something when they try to taper, uh, it could happen. Um, over the short term and, you know, derivatives and the kind of the debt in the crypto markets, right? So like I can go out and I can borrow 50 bucks of dollars against $100 of Bitcoin. Uh, but if the Bitcoin price declines, well, I'm going to eventually have to cover. I might have to sell some Bitcoin. Uh, I might be a forced seller. And so that can have, you know, kind of these com these ca like cascading effects in the market at times. Um, so it's not my base case at all that we see Bitcoin at 25, 20,000, but if equity is dumped, then everything's on the table. And I think ultimately, like, honestly, it would be a really good scenario for it to happen uh, because if everything, not just Bitcoin markets, but if the NASDAQ continued to just absolutely tank in the housing market and like everything in this fiat credit system unwound, well, the response would be bigger than 2020. It would be a unprecedented stimulus, more printing, yada, yada. And so like, you know, that, that's kind of a welcome opportunity from, from my perspective. Um, but I, I don't see it honestly getting that far. I think the Fed won't even, their, their expectation of four or five hikes in 2022 is advantageous. Uh, we'll see if they get there. But yeah, I mean, I think for now, 30,000, 32,000, that kind of level, uh, really, really strong support. Um, and we see like derivative markets have basically completely, uh, they're, they're no longer bullish whatsoever and actually have turned bearish. So uh you know, from that from that kind of perspective, uh, things that look you know pretty healthy. Uh, anybody that's kind of wanted to sell over the past couple of months has sold. Um, so it would really take take something pretty extraordinary to, to break below that. Got it. So if we want to like get an overview over the whole situation, like um, what what would I mean? What kind of situation would would make uh, like change your mind, like or change your I don't know, perspective analysis. Like what what would happen? Like if I don't know, a war breaks out. Hopefully not. I mean I'm not sure whether it's all. It's just a theater, you know, in Ukraine. And I don't know. There's a lot of people saying it could really break out and um, or geopolitically or you know more nation state or smaller nation states adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. I mean, do you think that's that's possible in your from your perspective? that you know sort of a you know to to turn you know the uh, um, uh, call it like what what parker lewis calls it our gradual and suddenly uh, moments uh -huh. is that something like that lingers in your mind like um something unexpected yeah i mean i definitely ex honestly expect that in 2022 i think we're going to see smaller nation states i think we're going to see increasing kind of a bifurcation of of u.s jurisdictions uh supporting bitcoin crypto industry generally um, and so that's kind of all my base case. I think uh, it's kind of the game theory playing out. And so, you know, those sort of things, like if, for instance, like if you saw some just like kind of hype announcement in like an altcoin or like a small, like GameStop announces they're supporting Dogecoin and the price jumps immediately. But like with Bitcoin, like El Salvador adopts Bitcoin and they say it's legal tender and there's a huge first step and the price does nothing. And then the price sells off and like, it's just the reality is it's like at a uh, $700 billion asset, like there's a ton of liquidity and, and order books uh, and flows. Like Bitcoin's not just responding. I mean, I guess if a central bank said, hey, we're buying Bitcoin with printed money, like all bets are off. But like, or like, you know, Apple says, hey, we bought two, uh, we bought 5 billion bucks of Bitcoin and we're going to buy every quarter. Uh, that would be different. Um, but I think generally we're, 
we're just going to see kind of the steady flow of good news, the steady kind of buildup of better and better fundamentals, whether it's lightning adoption, whether it's, uh, you know, regulatory clarity, whether it's increasing the amount of publicly traded miners who have access to cheap capital, um, you know, uh, states supporting Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin and treasury, legal tender laws, all this stuff is like positive news. Uh, but like, it's not like jumping up with the price. Um, so like fundamentals improving, price obviously down 50% from the highs. Could we go lower? For sure. Like, I mean, it's definitely possible. Uh, but, you know, in terms of like risk reward, like Bitcoin is extremely attractive, probably more attractive than it's been all of all of 2021. And so, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I think about it. I, I don't think it, like in terms of uh, certainties over short-term, medium-term timeframes, I mean, I guess I would... I would say I'm most certain that Bitcoin's the best money ever uh, and that nothing can kind of usurp it or, or, or at least, you know, change my view on that uh, unless like a few kind of crazy things happen that I really don't think have any chance of occurring. But like, so I guess long term, I'm just like, yeah, Bitcoin is one. Bitcoin's going to win. So uh, I don't really, if, if something happens in the short term, if Bitcoin goes up, down, sideways, flat, like, you know, I'm kind of unbothered, but I enjoy analyzing it uh, and kind of seeing seeing the different scenarios and how they could play out. I really do enjoy that, and I find it like intellectually stimulating. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, base case is that we're close to a local bottom. It, we might have already bottomed, uh, and if if you're thinking of allocating, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold off. I think it's it's definitely attractive at the moment. You know, when I listen to um... Greg Foss or what's his other uh, gold? I mean, he's a, not a gold. He's a gold, but 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 he's a total Bitcoin. Like Lawrence Lepard, like yeah. uh, all these guys, you know, who are who who know or who have connection with Jeff Booth, who knows a lot of you know people in the background. So it seems I have the impression there's a lot of you know talking and and you know in the background something is behind the scenes, something is going on. Um, and and the way I understood it, I think it was on a, some kind of uh, I don't know spaces, Twitter spaces, where where Greg Foss or somebody else said the institutions, if they go you know into action, they want to do it sort of a, they do it together or, some, or simultaneously. I mean, do you have the impression that there's like they are already just waiting for a signal? Like I don't know, you know, whether it be as you said, you know, regulatory or um, you know, sort of a risk management, you know, or or is there something going on like behind the scenes where uh, it's just a matter of time and it, it just, you know, it could happen anytime that this is what I'm like curious about, like is or, you know, I don't know, hedge funds so, I don't know, or, or sovereign funds or pension funds or, you know, just big institutions coming in all of a sudden. Is that is that something in the realm of possibility or? Yeah, I, I would say. Um... You know, we, we just saw like Canadian pension fund uh, buy a big stake in FTX. Um, so like so stuff like that is is, you know, just like a, a small little news tidbit, but kind of shows there's an appetite for this. Like people are slowly coming to understand this thing's not going away. So they bought a, a slice of a you know private exchange. But, uh, you know, Bitcoin, allocating to Bitcoin, the asset, a liquid asset, it's actually probably safer from that point of view. And so, uh, you know, we saw all this stuff in 2021 with NYDIG, right? Like they're partnering with all of these regional banks around the world to offer Bitcoin stuff. That's being rolled out this year. That's being rolled out this year in the next probably 12, 18 months. Um, so like that is something that just two years ago would have been huge. It would have been unprecedented. Uh, and so like, you're going to be able to log into your TD, but, or maybe, maybe not TD, but you're going to be able to log into your whatever local regional bank, you know, with your classic bank branch, and you're gonna be able to buy Bitcoin in your mobile app through NIDIG. Um, so like, just just something that's like huge. that. Where that's huge. huh? I mean, that that would just just open the gates for the masses, right? Is that what it's all about? The, the, this yeah, I mean, for sure. I think I think, you know, and that's just one example. It's just like, just the kind of normalization of this asset. It's not going away. You know, uh, like, you, if you've wanted to get Bitcoin exposure for the last five years, you could have gotten it. But for like someone that's 60 years old, like they don't want to download Coinbase or Cash App. Like they don't want to get a whole new app and do it on their phone. They want to call up Charles Schwab and be like, hey, give me some Bitcoin. Or they want to go like log into their trading account and buy some Bitcoin. And so like, you know, we haven't, we will probably get a spot ETF in the coming year. I don't know when, I don't know Gary Gensler's motives. That's a catalyst. And, uh, you know, another, another few catalysts are like, increasing geopolitical adoption, the integration with the financial system. And I think we'll increasingly see, uh, you know, as kind of 
Bitcoin is treated as this, this just, you know, risk on asset along with everything else. Like it's, it's less than a trillion dollars equities, this equity index uh, of tech and all that's tens of trillions. And there's unprofitable tech companies that are with crazy high market caps. And so like, if you're a pension fund, if you're an endowment, if you're, you know, you're going to gain exposure. And, and like we saw that at 20, 2021, just start, you saw a, a few kind of credit funds, uh, debt funds. They just said, okay, we're going to get a little bit of Bitcoin. And so like, they're not done buying. That's for, that's for sure. I mean, these, these institutions think with not month, week to week, month to month, but year, decade, you know, multiple decade long time horizons, because they have to, they have, they have liabilities over the next 30 years. Um, so that's just a start. Um, we're going to see a bunch of energy companies and all, also like, you know, all that stuff that's going to be like, you know, just another kind of narrative aspect to it. And so, you know, what comes next, I'm not entirely sure. I just know that everybody's coming and most people in the world are extremely underweight and absolutely scarce asset. So, you know, supply and demand, one thing has to happen. You've heard, you know, about this, I don't know what to call it. Is it like seemingly positive announcements or gossip or whatever about like Russia, like, you know, Putin talking about like, you know, sort of a positive regulatory environment for crypto, sort of crypto or and Bitcoin. Like, would you, what if, what if they really, what if some countries like Russia, China, I don't know, Iran, or all these countries, you know, who are still dependent on the SWIFT system? all of a sudden start pegging it or, you know, attach, attaching it to, to Bitcoin and, you know, they trade in bit, would that, would that be like a huge ca catalyst, a catalyst, what do you call it? Like a accelerator? Yeah. I mean, for sure. I think it's, it's only natural for company or for countries that are like, you know, dollarized or have access to the SWIFT system. Like where traditionally the U S has had a choke point and they just said, okay, you're cut off or you're sanctioned. Um, especially energy rich countries like Russia, right? Like, I mean, they're, Bitcoin mining is just a natural synergy uh, to kind of plug in there. So it's like we can sell our energy at really extremely attractive prices currently. We have a settlement network that's global, that can't be censored. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? So like it's going to happen. Does it happen in 2022? If Putin starts mining Bitcoin, if they start, Russia starts stacking Bitcoin in the balance sheet, they have a bunch of gold, do they announce it? I mean, the game theory says they don't announce it and they just do it quietly. So like, is it going to happen this year? I don't know. Uh, I doubt they announce it if they do, but like they're going to do it in, in, in this decade. You know, everybody's going to, everybody's going to do it. You're going to see uh, everybody kind of realizes that mining Bitcoin with excess energy is the best thing you could possibly do. And right now, like with, with just dynamics between hash rate and minor revenue, like I think the publicly traded miners, their average production cost of Bitcoin over the last quarter was 10 K. Wow. So, so they, they produce Bitcoin for 10K and it's 37,000 or 50,000, whatever it was at the time. So like, if you have anything but extremely expensive energy, like you can be profitably mining Bitcoin today. So like, it's a no brainer, you know, Intel is announcing they're coming out with a Bitcoin mining uh, chip, ASIC. That's huge. They're a $250 billion company. Like all of these things are just like, you know, another box that's checked. Uh, Bitcoin's climbing that wall of worry. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's just like, we're still early. It doesn't feel like it. And we're in our, you know, gave on, we're in our own echo chamber every day where we're just like talking with other people that get it. But like, the reality is like most of the world's like, it's a Ponzi scheme. Like <laughs> it's, we're still so early to it. It's kind of, it's almost unbelievable. Are you a fan of, uh, home mining? I mean, would you, would you, I mean, not recommend, but would you, would you say, Hey, if you have like a relatively cheap or average price, electricity would you would you tell someone hey go ahead you know i mean what do you have to lose is is that sort of your attitude or what, what do you what do you think about home mining yeah for sure i mean especially in colder climates um i haven't haven't plugged it in unfortunately but uh you know where i live is pretty cold and we required some like pretty cheap miners they're not efficient at whatsoever uh but you know i know a lot of people that have built setups that they plug their miners in they they spit off a bunch of heat and, and noise. So you have to kind of figure that out. But if you can, you know, compress the noise a little oh, bit. Oh, there, uh, there are solutions already, right? I mean, there's so many yeah. people like working behind like immersion, like fluid, whatever, or like, you know, super soundproof boxes, like Steve Warber mm -hmm. of Upstream or whatever. Yeah. It's really impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, like in, in that scenario, it's a no brainer, you know, you they kick off heat, you heat your house and you're basically, you know, mining Bitcoin. Like I, I know someone that, they live in like the north. They live it's zero degrees outside. Awesome. And they and they <laughs> don't they don't have a heating bill. 
That's a, yeah. but they have a Bitcoin mining bill, and so that's like, a no-brainer, huh? Yeah, it's a no-brainer. I, so, I mean, can know. I ask you? Do you mine? Do you? I mean, do you mine at home or? or... Or, I haven't yet, unfortunately. I, okay. I, uh, I, I, been, you know, been lagging, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's the plan eventually. You know, I mean, uh, there's, uh, I don't know whether you're up to date, you know, with this whole tyrannical, you know, dictat totalitarian shit that's going on in Austria, Germany, Europe, everywhere. I mean, you know, with this whole vaccine. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of people thinking seriously about migrating, about, you know, moving out of the country because of this whole, you know, mandatory vaccination, this whole tyranny bullshit, you know, all these corona bullshit so um would you say that let's say you know el salvador with its volcano bonds i mean this is what i'm, what I'm trying to ask i guess if if that really takes off and you know they can and they are able you know to to just make themselves independent from this whole you know criminal imf <laughs> and just you know build infrastructure and you know be totally advanced in technology infrastructure bring in entrepreneurs investors what, what 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 is your on your horizon this is what i think i'm trying to get at is is that something that can all of a sudden you know change like be a paradigm shift yeah 100 percent. i mean that's one of the more exciting aspects of bitcoin uh to be honest is like you know i tend to focus on the financial side of things uh you know data numbers all that but uh, deep down bitcoin is freedom sovereignty um you know there's an increasing amount of people especially after 2020 that make in, an income from their smartphone, make an income from their laptop. And so like anywhere that's a Wi-Fi signal, uh, obviously there's, you know, tax laws and, uh, you know, like citizenship and, and all this stuff that's like, you know, kind of trying to keep you walled in. But in the U.S., especially like, you know, uh, we've seen a huge migration from blue states that want to make you force you to use vaccine passports and wear a mask outside and do all this stuff to red states where they're you know they're saying hey you're free come here live here you don't have to pay tax you know income tax like all the and so that's just the us and uh, and obviously there's there's not everyone in the world has the the luxury of of having a country with 50 jurisdictions to choose from but uh we're seeing you know i know personally like at, a, at an individual friendship level people that have literally ab uprooted abandoned their country their friends and family because of tyrannical uh, acts over the last two years and move somewhere else that's free. Um, and whether that's, you know, <laughs> legal on paper or not, they're saying, no, I'm gonna take my wealth with Bitcoin. I'm gonna go move somewhere else. I can, I can provide value and, and produce value anywhere in the world. And I'm not going to subject myself to this uh, tyranny. And so like, we, you know, we, that sovereign individual thesis is right back there on my, on my shelf. Yeah. I see. <laughs> That's, you know, that's, that's at play. And so, uh, you know, the, the traditional, you know, the, the bureaucrats, the politicians, uh, I don't, some of them understand, but I think many of them are, you know, don't see what's, what's coming and don't see that, you know, for, for once, uh, people actually have legitimate uh, optionality. And, you know, they don't have to be subject to, to tyrannical laws and uh, arbitrary rule because they'll just say, all right, I'll move. And you won't get any of my capital when I move too, you know. And that's, you know, I mean, we can't emphasize that enough. It's just so fucking unique. You just, you know, whatever you assets you have or you have a property or any kind of property or real estate or anything, you know, you just sell it. And in un unfusca it's unconfiscatable. It's not, you can't seize it. You can't confiscate it. You can just, you know, put it in your brain and and just go anywhere, right? I mean, this has never been possible. I mean, just imagine you'd have some, you know, bars of gold or whatever it's called, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> try to resolve that, right? So, okay, let me, I'm not sure whether these questions are really, um, they, they're in German for my girlfriend's brother, because I know you are in about half an hour on Bitcoin Magazine, right? So I don't want to take too much time of you. Um, can you, uh, it says, can you um, can you sort of dedicate like a transaction with a, uh, on on chain and Lightning with uh, with a purpose? Like like, can you attach a purpose and a payment reference or uh, sort of a sender? Is is that like a question? You can you like? Do you understand what what that means? Or uh, yeah, I mean, I. I would say that I don't uh, look too much at individual transactions uh, with mm -hmm. kind of on-chain analysis, more looking at kind of aggregate stuff. Uh, and we can see, uh, you know, we can see traditionally like two of two multi-sigs, like a lightning channel. We can kind of see what 
type of address uh, or, you know, um, multi-sig, we can kind of see that quorum on chain. So you can see like what's a public lightning channel or you can assume with pretty good, uh, you know, you can assume with a pretty uh, high likelihood. But with uh, Taproot, we haven't seen this really take off yet, but with Taproot, you can kind of that uh, transparency of what's a multi-sig, what's a lightning channel, what's just a regular address. You can't see it. Uh, it takes all of that uh, and just, and kind of, you know, muddies the waters. So uh, not, not sure if I answered that exact question, but, uh, you know, Taproot from a privacy perspective is, is pretty optimal when oh, yeah. you're talking about, one, you know, yeah. that, that on-chain analytics. Mm -hmm. The other one is, can you just, you know, any like uh, arbiter or, uh, man or uh, random, can you like put a, a random text um, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, like write a text on a Bitcoin blockchain instead of a transaction and with what kind of tool or website can you like read it out? Is that something you can answer? I think it's too technical. But Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, in a Bitcoin transaction is what's called an op, an op return. So you can include text, uh, but you have to actually send a transaction. So you can like send the transaction to yourself uh, and broadcast it or you can, uh, you know, to send it to someone else and in the op return say, say something. Uh, and so like, you know, like, for example, in the Genesis block, uh, you know, Chancellor on the brink of, of second bailout for big banks, uh, Satoshi encoded a timestamp in the op return. And so something like that you can uh, kind of include, but you actually, you can't just put blank text. You actually have to send the transaction to, to get it on, uh, you know, exactly. on that immediate yeah. ledger. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. Uh, the, the last one would be with what kind of tool can you verify uh, the winner, winner hash, like, like the ultimate like winner like the hash that wins i guess the you know the the, the, the block is that the, the question i'm not sure yeah uh i mean i would just say like you know miners are, are looking for a valid nonce is what it's technically called and so uh when they find that um and i'm not the most well spoken on this but uh essentially uh all all nodes verify that it's a valid hash or a valid nonce uh and they found basically that they found that next block and so then um, you know, those, those blocks connect to the, the, the <laughs> basically connect with the previous block. Um, and again, I could be more well-spoken on this, but the nodes are what ultimately verify yeah. it. And so if you try to say, Hey, I'm in a block and you know, you, you, uh, show me a hash or show my node, that's not actually valid, then I'm just going to reject it. And you're not going to be able to extend the chain. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what is what is for you? Uh, I mean, what what's the most exciting stuff that's happening on in the lightning uh, sector, like like our lightning development? What what is what is it that makes you really excited? To yeah, I mean, some some things that haven't really uh, manifested yet, but uh, are in the pipe. Uh, from what I'm hearing, is that we're gonna see. Um, so obviously, lightning adoption is taking off. Um, stuff like Twitter and all that, which we don't even talk about anymore. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, and funny enough, like, so when you, you know, Kayvon, if you wanted to send me some sats, uh, right now it's with a strike integration, but I don't, you know, you're sending me dollar values and I receive dollars. Um, and so there's actually like Tether and Bitfinex, uh, you know, and Tether as, as the stable coin is on the Ethereum blockchain and the Solana blockchain and the Tron blockchain and all these altcoin chains, they have those stable coin assets. Well, uh, Tether is actually going to, uh, is working to establish uh, really these big fat lightning channels, uh, these huge massive lightning channels, uh, just kind of with itself. And they're going to uh, create uh, synthetic stable coin US dollars on the Bitcoin lightning network. Um, so that's pretty exciting because like, you know, just being able to have like, and essentially like with, with lightning, uh, you can have like, and maybe not just Tether, but in general, you can have like, this sort of like synthetic dollar um, with like, with how financial markets work, with how Bitcoin derivatives work, you can have, like if you're short Bitcoin on a, on a derivatives market, if you're, if you are, are have Bitcoin collateral and you are short, one X short Bitcoin, uh, you're essentially, you're holding a synthetic dollar because when the price ticks down, your collateral value is, is decreasing, but your short position is increasing by the same exact amount. So it's just like you're holding a synthetic dollar. If your price goes up, your short position is decreasing, but your collateral value is increasing, you're holding a synthetic dollar. 
So with, with Lightning, uh, there's some pretty interesting things that haven't been built yet, but a, re- a lot of really smart people are working on. That's essentially, we're going to be able to have, yeah, we have native Satoshis, we have Bitcoin, but if you want that. But in the meantime, while there's still exchange rate volatility, while there is still, you know, the daily volatility of Bitcoin, the week to week, month to month volatility, you can have like almost a, a synthetic dollar, but you don't need to have it custodied with USDC or Tether or a, a commercial bank, a central bank digital currency, you can just use it native with Lightning. So it's not there yet. It's not built out and I wish it was, but the thing that excites me is that a ton of really smart people are working to solve this stuff. And when we get it, we'll have not only like censorship resistant Satoshis, but also we'll have like censorship resistant, uh, you know, dollars, essentially synthetic dollars, which is, which is pretty cool uh, and definitely like has a pretty big use case. Okay. Um- when, when when people like there's you know a bunch of people and they talk about stable coin they're so super excited like what is it can you explain to me like or layman terms like what is it that that makes the bitcoin development a mass adoption mass adoption or just you know i don't know the the the, 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 the bullishness like what, what is it that that people are so bullish about stable coins for for the bitcoin space yeah so i think um you know for the time being bitcoin is is not legal tender in the u.s um, or really any country besides El Salvador. Um, and so as Bitcoin is a monetary asset, it's a bearer asset. Uh, it allows for you in the same way that you can, if you own a house and you, uh, or if you own a bunch of Apple stock uh, and you want to borrow some money and you don't want to pay taxes, you don't have to sell the stock. You can borrow against it. Um, so with stable coins uh, and the introduction of stable coins and the kind of the whole crypto ecosystem, Bitcoin in particular, it allows for you to over collateralize because uh, you know a house is is not volatile really. I mean, there's obviously uh, circumstances where it is, but um, it's not trading every single day like like a Bitcoin is. Uh, but I can say I can pledge ten thousand dollars of Bitcoin and get five thousand dollars back of, uh, of 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 dollars, or I can get two thousand dollars back if I'm risk averse. Um, and so, what stable coins? The reason they're like you know pretty advantageous is that. Most people are, you know, a lot of people I know in the Bitcoin ecosystem, myself included, you know, a lot of hardcore hodlers that are saying I'm never selling are sitting on like 100% of their net worth in Bitcoin or like a a huge, huge amount. Well, do you want to sell if you're 100% in Bitcoin? Well, no, I don't want to sell. Okay, well, then what are you going to do? You're just going to work forever? I guess that's a solution. But if you want to, if you want to invest, if you want to spend, if you want to, you know, buy a nice house, you can collateralize some of that Bitcoin just a little bit get the dollars uh, and, and, and finance things. And so that's where stable coins really come into play. Um, it, it's kind of establishing its own native cost of capital. So like the Fed sets interest rates. Well, in the Bitcoin crypto ecosystem, there's a, there's a dollar lending rate and borrowing rate and it's, it's variable. I mean, it's not set by anyone or any one thing, but what, what stable coins really allow you to do is allow this kind of collateralization, the financialization of Bitcoin to occur. Uh, as well as kind of like it allows for you know you to potentially like risk off right uh, for a while in the whole crypto ecosystem the exchanges it was Bitcoin and a bunch of altcoins but no no kind of dollars and so you know you're, the best case scenario was you held Bitcoin and it went down fifty percent while everything else went down ninety percent and so we're focused on Bitcoin only but just having you know the Bitcoin price many people think of it in BTC USD and the dollar for better or worse is still that kind of standard global unit of account. And I think that's changing, but it's not changing yet. And so uh, for the meantime, stable coins, whether it's USDC or Tether or Lightning, you know, stable coins or central bank digital currencies, if they come, <laughs> you know, it still plays a role. And so I think uh, it's kind of exciting just seeing that development and the financialization of this ecosystem in general. Okay, super. Um, so last question, you know about this there's this whole discussion about like you know like what, what how is the fed or uh, the central banks i mean even you know even this european central bank sort of uh an extended arm of the federal reserve i mean just just uh, the privately owned federal reserve i mean um do you see i mean they can't they can't you know hi, you know they can't uh um 
they can't go up with the rate. So, or, or at least no, not really, uh, uh, um, uh, not really in a real sense. So, uh, do you see like w w we have we are in there's like uh, what is, what's the U.S. debt now officially like thirty trillion. There are some yeah. people like talking about like fifty. There, it's, it's it could easily go to fifty, hundred trillion because you know it's like trillions. It's like you know I mean it's it's sort of a terminology that's 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 wasn't even like you know uh, acceptable in in after the you know the crash of two thousand eight. So what do you see on the horizon like with the the, the you know the, the astronomical debt that's that's upcoming or the the inflation uh, where do you see this going yeah i think we're just you know we're at a point of no return in the debt spiral so like federal debt to gdp is over 100% total debt to gdp is 400% um, and so you know the if you just think of debt to gdp the total debt to gdp at 400% uh, you know, since 1971, I ran the numbers today. Since 1971, uh, the basically the GDP has increased 20x. So nominal GDP has gone from like one trillion, like one point something trillion, to like 23 trillion. It's gone up like 20x. But debt has gone up uh, by by 50x. So so we saw debt to GDP go from like 100% to 400%. So the income that we need. That's, that is used to pay off the interest and principal on the debt has risen by 20x, but the debt itself has risen by 50x. So like the math doesn't compute, it doesn't work. So how is it resolved? Well, it's resolved by the currency just getting pillaged. The currency is the error term. Um, and so, you know, we're in a debt spiral and uh, as for, you know, in a credit-based money system, the only way to, uh, you know, grow is more credit, which means more more loans, more interest, and it's just a snowball. And we've are we've passed the point of no return. Like mathematically speaking, it's not just like I'm not just being like, oh yeah, it's too late, guys. Like no, like le legitimately, it's mathematically too late. There was a time, say like in maybe '07 or even like '09, if we could have maybe weaned off it, but those choices were made, and you know we we're, we're past that point. So uh, it's either total collapse or uh you know perpetual inflation and so bitcoin is kind of just an opt-out uh so where i see the debt i mean i'm no macro uh you know I, i'm no macroeconomic expert and you know, i don't know what the, the treasury is doing tomorrow but i do know that debt is going to go up and to the right uh and there's there's no way to really pay it down it's going to continue to go up in some and somewhat of like a ponzi like fashion and so you know, I don't really want to play that game, so I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. And exactly, yeah. And the system, you know, is so independent. I mean, it's such a miracle that the system can, you know, uh, kick down the can down the road uh, and procrastinate, and, and it's, it's just amazing. I mean, we we aren't, we aren't even talking about like uh, we aren't even talking about like unfunded liabilities. This is, I mean, the whole system is broke. The, I mean, the pension funds are in, they're broke, you know, especially in Europe. I mean, they're just broke. Uh, um, this is something that's yeah just boggles my mind. But anyway, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's what's uh, what's the the real like number in in the states. It's like under 60, 180 trillion with unfunded liabilities. But it, does it matter? Really, it doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's we're we're on an unsustainable path, and you know the numbers. The reality is, like, if any politician is is you know approached and they're saying, all right, are we going to default? Are we going to are we going to be now like reverse course and be and be uh what's it called uh prudent are we going to you know tighten this and pay down our debt no the incentive is spend more money you know we're gonna stimulus we're gonna make people feel good we're gonna we're gonna spend our grow our way out of this when in reality it's not what's happening at all but uh the political incentives are just spend 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 so that's what's happening you know just write just write a check write a blank check fed will buy the bonds and we'll we'll rack up some more debt i mean it's nothing but a thing especially when you know terms are four years right no one's thinking in any term like long term uh, just time politics rising. yeah um so dylan uh just okay one one final question about this whole central because there's a you know there's an agenda going i mean you can you know there there it's all in our faces now the whole their their agenda whatever it's called central bank digital currencies great reset this i mean all this theater and 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 i don't know what to call it false flag theater uh i mean what what if are they pushing it for like central like control central control is that um yeah, I mean, 
there's definitely some sort of uh, agenda by a certain group of people going on. Um, some definitely some political puppets in place. I mean, I'm no uh, expert or I don't know who's, if there's a man behind the curtain other than just kind of corrupt incentives are, are you know, creating uh, these undesirable outcomes for lots of people in lots of different places. Uh, definitely some sort of power grab. And the last two years has definitely been clear winners and losers of a lot of the stuff that's happening. So I, I think ultimately it's just a, a lot of the stuff, the, the clamp down on freedoms, um, you know, the, the tyrannical political leaders, it's, it's just a result of mis you know, misincentives um, and a corrupt, corrupt money, ultimately. Yeah, totally, I mean, totally corrupt, yeah. Um, so but is it good for Bitcoin? That's my question. I mean, is this whole process like good for Bitcoin for this, you know, because it just, you know, it just pushes the Bitcoiners more and more, you know, into more decentralization, more, you know, uh, a different incentives game, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's it's good for Bitcoin. I mean, I guess every, <laughs> everything is good for Bitcoin. But no, I mean, uh, it, it's just, you know, glad we have Bitcoin, glad that Bitcoin exists yeah. uh, as, as a, you know, alternative, as an escape hash, because without it, it would be a lot more dark. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Well, Dylan, I really enjoyed um, talking to you and so much to learn. Um, is there any other final thoughts or where can people find you? Uh, I mean, you are like, you do so many, so much stuff. I mean, you are, uh, you are a Bit Bitcoin Incorporated, head of market research, UTXO management analyst, a lead ma uh, analyst in UTXO management. You do the Bitcoin, you know, you focus on the Bitcoin market deep dive. Uh, so anybody can subscribe to your newsletter, co-founder of 21st Paradigm. Is there anything else you do? <laughs> uh, no, that about covers it. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a while since we caught up, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can find me on, been find me on Twitter for the most part. I hang out there a good amount. And so, uh, you know, just interact uh, and, you know, we can we can talk back and forth. See you, see you on the web. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, Dylan, I'll hopefully talk to you soon, uh, maybe in a half a year or so. And let's do a recap then. All right. So that was Dylan Leclerc. And yeah, um, if you are total new, don't forget, uh, go on the links I put in the show notes. Uh, get yourself hard, you know, a hardware wallet. If you still have your Bitcoin on the exchange, that's the most important thing. No, uh, not your keys, not your coins. Uh, use the discount, coin, uh, discount co code Davani. That's my last name, D-A-V-A-N-I. And yeah, just uh, follow Dylan Leclerc on Twitter. Uh, subscribe to to his uh, to his newsletter. Amazing stuff, ama amazing analysis. And follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. Subscribe to my podcast platforms. And yes, I appreciate any kind of feedback, suggestions for recommendations, or you know, suggestions for future interview guests or topics. Uh, could be in any shape of you know shape or form you know related to bitcoin definitely uh could be the bigger picture even geopolitics macroeconomics uh insider whistleblowers if you have anybody you, you can refer to me really appreciate that my name is kevin davani i'm the host of the kevin davani connection show and i'll see you soon